Murray, and welcome to the next episode of FinOps Fridays. I'm here with Dita, and we're here today to talk all about forecasting. Um, so, Dita, you want to give a quick introduction of yourself to the audience? Yeah, of course. Uh, hey, I'm Dita Mason. I've been working on cloud FinOps since 2013 at companies like Google, Netflix, Intuit, and most recently, Roku. I'm a certified FinOps practitioner, and I'm also a FinOps ambassador. Awesome. Thanks, Dita. Um, now, forecasting, in, in a general sense, in terms of IT and business, what exactly is forecasting? You know, things like is estimating, predicting the future? Is it about costs? Is it about future usage? Give us a little bit of a, an insight into the generic, uh, what forecasting is generically. Yes, of course, cloud forecasting is about how finance, operations, and executives build models to forecast cloud spend and allocate budgets to business units. Excellent. In terms of those models, are they well-defined models? Is there a set of models for cloud? Or is it um, sort of things that you grow organically depending upon your you know, uniqueness in the organizations? It depends on each organization does their, does their own models, right? Um, it depends what works for you. And in in which stage of maturity you are uh, when you begin your cloud forecasting journey, right? You may have a finance department that has a um, very specific uh, way of doing cloud forecasting, or you may have a finance department that is new to it and um, you need to help them to build those requirements. Gotcha, awesome. And in terms of, you know, we spoke about forecasting generically. Uh, in terms of, of cloud and FinOps, is there a difference to regular IT finance forecasting? You know, some of our audience are a traditional finance background. So what is the advice that you would give to them? What is different about cloud and FinOps forecasting versus regular, or is it actually the same? <laughs> so uh, regular IT and finance forecasting concerns itself with things like cost of sales or cost of revenue, sales and marketing expenses general and administrative expensive, headcount, real estate, those sort of things. Generally, these expenditures are more stable, making them easier to predict. Forecasts can be done centrally by a single person or a small team. A variable spend model of the cloud makes cloud forecasting quite challenging, as purchasing decisions are decentralized to the individual engineers. Got it. So it really is basically the same thing, but we're dealing with a very different demon. The data source, the behavior of yes. what we're trying to forecast is absolutely somewhat seemingly random or a lot more, a lot less predictable. That's right. Okay, awesome. Um, and I want you to try and sell me. It's the same as budgeting. I've got my quirks. Anyone that knows me, you know, sell me on forecasting. Do we actually need forecasting? If we think, you know, looking back in, in IT and history, we go back to the early 2000s, we had the dot-com bust. The late 2000s, we had the GFC. You know, we've had the recent events about the global virus outbreak. Now we've got the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I don't think anyone accurately forecasted these events. So, so what exactly is the point of forecasting if, especially with cloud, you know, we said that it always changes. It's always going to rapidly evolve. Usage is going to change. What's the point of forecasting if the only thing you can guarantee is that it's actually going to be incorrect. So, so why would you do it? So, so sell me on the point of it because I can guarantee you the answer you give me from forecasting will always be wrong. Uh, in a sense, yes, you're right. Uh, but uh, Okay, good, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me unpack that a little bit, right? Uh, while hmm. cloud spend is a relative small portion of an organization's total revenue, uh, over or under forecasting substantially impacts innovation. The kind of projects that will create differentiating factors that give the business a competitive advantage. Uh, this makes cloud forecasting an important activity to help with innovation. Now, you mentioned, uh, you know, dot com uh, bubble burst, uh, maybe, you know, Ukraine invasion, those kind of things. Um, I have to admit, yes, many of these events are simply impossible to forecast. Uh, while we want to be as accurate as possible when forecasting, the goal of forecasting is not to predict these types of events. The goal is to be able to re forecast using the new parameters and provide the business with actionable insights quickly. Uh, this part this is sort of part of the fail fast methodology, right? Uh, recognize when something isn't working and then pivot in a timely manner. So it's more, I, I guess, in a sense, 
this is the direction we're trending. Like it looks like our expenses are going to be too high. It looks like we're going versus this is going to be the exact answer at this point in time. It's more exactly. of a, a trend. We're starting to go into a bit of a red territory. We may need to correct or we may need to look further into a type of thing. Yes, exactly. I mean, are you 10% over budget, 30% over budget, 100% over budget, right? Uh, those will have different actions. <laughs> it, it, yeah, so if, if it's 33 or 35, it doesn't matter. But ballpark, we know that we're in somewhat of a bit of a state of trouble. It's not 100% over budget and it's not 2%. There is some concern. So it's sort of that varying level there. That's right. And you would then also um, maybe at the at the lowest level compare it to um, how the business is growing, right? If your business is growing 30%, and you are 30% over budget, or you know, you're know forecasting a 35% growth for the next uh, fiscal year, then you might be okay, right? Yes, the cloud is growing a little bit faster, but we also do some experimenting and we do some other things. Um, so uh, it, it is not troublesome. Now, if the business is growing 10% and the cloud is growing 50%, and you didn't just migrate from the data center, you have been in the cloud for, for multiple years, then that's a problem, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think, um, well, I mean, those events would impact other areas of the business as well. So this is nothing new for business forecasting. Um, these types of events, external factors would need to be accounted for as well. But whether or not it just makes cloud even more challenging to forecast and there's some problem. But um, is there any difference between you know, these external events, the impact that they have on regular marketing sales, whatever else, regular business and cloud, or are they sort of similar in terms of the way that they impact the forecasting of both of those? It also depends on your business, right? When um, COVID started, um, you know, we were very surprised that uh, TV, TV viewing went up for Roku, right? Um, so, you know, a lot of people magically found time to watch TV during business hours. So that is not something that we anticipated, right? We sort of anticipated a similar trend. So now as we are exiting COVID, we are anticipating a reversal, but we are also not sure how many of those people are still working from home or have, have flexible work schedules, right? Yep, uh, not yep. everyone has to work nine to five. Um, if you are doing procurement or something like that, right, or, or you're doing JIRA tickets and, and cranking out code, you can do that at all kinds uh, of times of the day, right? You don't have to be limited to that time frame. So it, it is extremely difficult for us to really predict um, how the, the you know, end of COVID is going to impact. And then compounding effect is that the end of 2022 is also supposed to be an economic downturn, right? So how will that affect um, player sales and watch watch hours? Yeah, gotcha. And in terms of, uh, you know, we're doing all this work, what does that actually drive within the overall business, doing forecasting for cloud? What's the output? What are we looking to achieve? Well, you know, um, when you look at a typical company spent, right, and you look at it as a pie chart, there is, I mean, roughly each company is a little different, right? But when you look at, you know, like Google, um, Nike, those kind of companies, right, Salesforce, how much do they spend? It's typically half is spent on, on headcount. Then you have like some kind of operations expense, some kind of, you know, physical buildings, um, those kind of things, uh, janitorial, landscaping, that kind of stuff, right? And you get a relatively small piece left that is sort of, you know, this is the revenue that we can spend on innovation. And, you know, when it de depends for each company what that innovation looks like, right? It, it will be different for Salesforce, it will be different for Nike, and it will be different for Google. For Roku, um, you know, we, we are looking at, we have a roadmap of our players and sound bars and TVs, 4K TVs and, and, and whatnot, right? Um, so there is that portion, um, and then is the cloud portion. So the, the challenge now is if you were to forecast substantially over, you're sort of reserving uh, funds for the cloud that you end up not spending. These funds could have been allocated to innovation projects, right? Um, like a remote control that you can talk to and say like, you know, hello Roku or something like that, right? Um, and if you are under forecasting, right? Uh, and, and your cloud spend ends, ends up higher, 
the effect will be that some of the projects or, or marketing campaigns um, that were in flight have to be halted. They have to be put on, on, on ice, uh, frozen, um, or postponed, or something like that. And a lot of those projects don't lend themselves really well to being halted mid-project. If you have a marketing campaign, uh, it typically has a ramp-up phase. The content is a little bit maybe more explanatory, more educational. Then you have sort of like the, the solid phase where you really push the product. Um, and the messaging is a little bit different. And then you have sort of like a, maybe a ramp out phase or you just turn it off, right? So depending where you are in your efforts, um, you know, halting a project may essentially waste any um, funds invested into it. God, yeah. So it's really making sure that if your business does need to change for internal, external factors, then it's going to be small adjustments and everything's going to keep moving versus pulling the pin, a lot of waste, a lot of re rework and throwing things out. That's right. Okay. And why um, Why is forecasting, again, you know, we look at the cloud, it's always changing, it's always going to be wrong. You know, why does FinOps, why is forecasting so critical to the FinOps discipline specifically? Well, it's um, it depends who does the forecasting, right? Um, I do a lot of outreach where I talk um, to other companies uh, some of them, the finance department does the, the cloud forecast, and, and that works for them, right? Uh, for example, ExxonMobil uh, works like that. Um, the, the FinOps team, I think, is sort of at the center of all the different types of communication. So it is, um, it is sort of lends itself because we already have those collaborative partnerships uh, with engineering, with finance, with uh, legal, with procurement, right? that we have already all those things in place that enable us um, to uh, also work on forecasting itself. Gotcha, gotcha, excellent, excellent. All right, so that brings us to our speed round questions. This is where we take a quick break from the actual topic of the show. We get to know our guest a little bit better and go through some questions. Uh, these are quick, sharp, short, yes or no. Uh, Dita, are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Definitely yes. <laughs> Beetroot on burgers. Uh, what on burgers? Beetroot. Um, as, I mean, as long as the burgers are, are uh, vegan patties, like an ultimate burger or something like that, sure. All right, we'll go for a yes. Uh, a cat person or a dog person? A dog person, but I like cats as well. Uh, red wine or white wine? Uh, red wine. Beer or spirits? Um, it depends. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Do you ask permission or beg for forgiveness? Um, it depends if it's my wife or if it's my employer. <laughs> How much trouble. Uh, for your employer, it's a professional show. For your employer. <laughs> uh, for my employer, uh, you know, I, I usually have a really good relationship where they, where they trust me. So I will try to do everything that I possibly can, all the footwork, right? And then once I have something that is good enough to be communicated, I will let them know, hey, uh, is this something that you want to proceed with? Nice. Uh, your favorite movie or director, producer, genre? Um, the Starship Troopers. Nice. Uh, tea or coffee? Um, neither, but I will go with coffee. <laughs> your favorite TV series? Um, I don't, don't really have one. I, I watch a lot, a lot of different things. Sci-fi usually. Yep. Sci-fi, some Western maybe. Uh, your favorite song, musician, genre of music? Um, you know, I used to be uh, listening to Eurodance, but um, I think I grew out of it. <laughs> uh, your favorite food? Uh, favorite food? Um, whatever my wife cooks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you go on holiday, do you prefer to be active, doing activities, or relax oh, and do nothing? Yeah, no, definitely. We are active. We do like um, zip lining, bungee jumping, all kinds of things, kayaking, um, snorkeling, scuba diving, uh, horseback riding. <laughs> nice. So when it's what? time to finish the holiday, it's time for an actual holiday type of thing. Yeah, I mean, we I, I derive energy from these uh, types of activities, so I, I like it a lot. 
Nice. Uh, do you prefer buildings and architecture or nature? Nature, definitely. Uh, your preferred superpower, supernatural ability? Oh, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, um, being able to read other people's minds. <laughs> but I'm afraid of what I will be able to discern from that. Um, what is your favorite vacation location? Um, it's usually forests like uh, Yosemite or something, Tahoe or something, uh, but not Tahoe for skiing, Tahoe for hiking. Yeah, nice. There's actually yep. some nice areas uh, out there, you know, a uh, desolation area. Uh, some of these areas you need permits. You need to actually register with a ranger station before they allow you to go there. Yeah, I did, I did Yosemite. Um, it was beautiful. I was amazed at America's natural beauty wilderness. It was yeah. absolutely fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Do you prefer to text or to talk? Uh, I think texting is is more efficient. Uh, your childhood nickname, if it's work friendly. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, for uh, my middle name, uh, Matthew, so Matt. Ah, there you go. Uh, what is your proudest moment, professional, personal? Um, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of them, right? Um, and and they are usually followed by less proud moments. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, one you know, one thing that that I like to uh, look back is when I joined at Google, right? Um, it was it was sort of like a dream come true, uh, and then I learned that uh, what I anticipated in my dream is a little bit different from reality, right? Uh, Google is like 200 uh, smaller companies, and each company is sort of run individually, so it's not like this this big thing that is uh, changing the world. It's a lot of small things that are doing small steps. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, that rounds out the lightning round, the speed round questions. Uh, you came up with a score of 93 and a half. You lost <laughs> half a point because you let the cat thing come into it. Uh, so not too bad. I'm actually um, dealing more with cats now because the, the neighbors uh, moved out and left the cats. Ah, oh, That's oh, terrible. No. <laughs> and uh, we, we, you know, dogs, I mean, Cats live a little bit longer, but dogs is like 12, 13 years. So we just had to put our dog down before COVID. And then we decided not to get another one because we didn't know how COVID will, will pan out, right? Yeah. Thankfully, yep. it, you know, while it, there was a lot of terrible things that happened, uh, it was not like, you know, an apocalypse of sorts. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, th that was, you know, people were like wearing gloves and like actually, <laughs> you know, uh, gas masks kind of things when going shopping, right? So yeah. It, was, yeah. it was a little bit crazy in the beginning. But um, now I'm actually dealing with, with the cats, you know, uh, that and a raccoon and a possum are, that, are come, <laughs> that are coming at night. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, both, both, I like both. So you always go into their backyard, they're now just coming back into your backyard to repay the favor. That's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they are hopping over the fence and and then, you know, we have like a bowl with cat food. And then at night, we have actually one of those motion, you know, activated cameras. So we see what else comes visiting at night. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I used to do the same thing. and I had my wallabies and my bandicoots and everything. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, so let's get back into the lovely world of forecasting. Uh, and let's go a little bit deeper into the uh, to the science, dare I say, the art of forecasting. Uh, ease us in here, Dita. What are the main types of forecasting? How are they sort of done? And, and what are the advantages of each? You know, uh, the forecasting methodology will largely depend on the maturity of the organization, right? Um, if you're just getting started, uh, look at your actual cloud spend by cloud vendor, by account, project, or subscription, to, you know, AWS, GCP, and Azure. Um, and just look at that, right? Identify the top spenders and ask these workload owners to estimate the future cloud spend. That's the best that you can do when you have nothing, right? Um, and that's trend-based? I mean, that is, I think, a step further, right? Yep. Um, you, you, at this phase, you're just having a spreadsheet and just starting to collate this information. 
Um, and you know, maybe no one even has looked at um, monthly spend in the cloud. You know, they were just too busy doing things like migrating or something like that. But, but you know, even at this rough stage, it will give you a, a, um, a signal. Uh, like we said earlier, right? Is your cloud spend growing 10%, 30%, 100%, right? Um, more. And how does this correlate to the, the growth of your business, right? Um, then later as you progress... Oh, sorry, data. Well, can I yeah, jump in there briefly in terms of, you know, that that's your starting point. And again, you know, it's yes. always going to be very inaccurate. As you're starting, I dare say you might be quite inaccurate, but it's, it is the point of starting to start to build the muscles, to start to get used to it. That's right. And it's not, what do I need to do? But it's, where do I need to look deeper is sort of the answer you get from that first phase in forecasting. That's absolutely right, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say you're in the crawl maturity, maybe you have never done anything like this before, right? You will learn how to um, get billing data from a cloud vendor, right? That will be um, several weeks in the journey, you know? Um, you will then learn, hey, you know what? This uh, Bob here in uh, with this workload is the number one spender. Who is Bob? Let's go and talk to him, right? Um, and you will start those building those uh, business relationships uh, within your organization. And um, you know maybe Bob didn't know he was the top spender, <laughs> right? So um, that will also provide some clarity, right? And then you need to um, look sort of like at your top five, top. Top ten, top three, right? Uh, depending where you are, and just start building that that practice, right? Of maybe once a year or once a quarter, we are looking at spend, and um, if if something goes, you know, very differently from what was anticipated, let's have, let's start to have a conversation of why that happened, right? Did a uh, migration start earlier than planned? Um, did an engineer build something and forgot to turn it off, right? Those are two different outcomes. That's really interesting also, not just, you know, one of the outcome is not just getting to the answer of forecasting and taking corrective action, but actually learning about your organization. Which which departments That's are right. really strong, which departments may need some additional resource and because they're not good, you can start to cross-pollinate and learn and build a stronger organization. That's right. And it will be different levels, right? Like, for example, there was at Intuit, um, there was one outlier that um, I was extremely upset with because their forecasts were uh, bad and they were responsible for a substantial amount of spend, maybe 15%. So when I started talking to this person, it turns out that it's him and another engineer. That is the entire team, right? <laughs> so, and, and there was there's other teams that have like a thousand members, right? 800 members, something like that, right? So I, I, you know, while their cloud spend was substantial, they did something that was really important, right? I didn't realize that it's just really two people that are doing this, um, and helping me realize that, and helping that person realize that, you know, oh, okay, I'm by myself responsible for 15% of all the company's um, cloud spend. Um, I, I need to put some guardrails, some boundaries, and some process around that. And also, so I'm just sort of really scratching at this organizational insight because I think it's something I never really saw could be such a good benefit. Are you also mm -hmm. concerned when your forecasting is too accurate? Hey, we, we can we can forecast to the nearest cent because we just run everything 24 seven and don't care about our actual requirements. Is that an also something you can get from and learn from the organization through forecasting that, hey, if it's too accurate, it maybe is a source of concern because you know, as I said, that they're not using that elasticity. There's no variance in the cost and there probably should be. You know, it, it really depends, right? Uh, I haven't heard finance <laughs> complain about forecasts being too accurate, to be honest, right? Um, that, that is never a problem. Um, at Roku, we use driver-based forecasting, right? And um, our uh, average variance is 2%. Um, typically, you associate with a crawl maturity 20% uh, forecast variance. You know, you're basically just spitballing using a spreadsheet. With a work maturity, you are associating a 10% uh, variance. And uh, so this is maybe where trend-based forecasting comes in, right? You're doing trend-based and uh, in a work maturity, and you get like a 10% variance. And then with a run maturity, you get 5% or better. So at Roku, we are at 2%. Our busiest month was uh, December, and the variance was 1% in, in December. So the system does a good job. Um, I haven't really seen uh, people complaining about uh, the 
it, the variance being too low, uh, that's that's a good thing usually. Um, however, we do see, you know, when you're over budget or under budget, right? And uh, the magnitude of, of that, right? So for example, what we have seen um, a common cause for being over budget is either uh, certain projects starting earlier than anticipated or um, things, experiments being left on. That's also something, right? If an experiment is unsuccessful, the engineer dis dismantles that immediately, right? It's all, all evidence has been deleted, right? <laughs> However, if the, if the experiment is successful, the engineer goes and it shows it around for weeks and weeks to come, right? And the thing costs like $800 a day, right? So um, the, the, those kind of things. And when you're substantially under, what I have seen is that projects didn't get started on time or are delayed. And uh, one of those reasons can be a headcount, right? For example, when we reached out and talked to, to an engineering manager um, about them being under, they cited that they were not able to hire quickly enough, right? And so it turns out that their um, you know, interview cycle was like a four to six month cycle. Um, and so I think getting a better process around that and, and um, tightening this down and, and reducing the time uh, help them to hire more quickly and be able to produce more work. Nice, nice. And you mentioned sort of trend and driver based. Um, mm -hmm. So trend is sort of looking at the existing data and sort of like, okay, which is that, you know, which way is that line sort of trending? Driver based is taking many more inputs to adjust on top of the trend. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, uh, in in a sense, right? Uh, so let's let's look at that. Um, Maybe very common in our core maturity is that people use trend based forecasting, right? Trend based forecasting typically uses exponential smoothing of some sort. It can be done in spreadsheets, but often this is where automation is uh, started being used, right? Um, and you use basically it's it's a formula. You have a cell that is an actual. You apply the formula to that, and that gives, gets you your forecast. And then you apply the same formula on that forecast to get the next forecast and so forth, right? Um, so you build out your 12 month or, you know, 48 month forecast, whatever uh, finance desires at this point, right? You build that out and, um, uh, you know, what is ideal, you want to be able to repeat that uh, quickly without a lot of churn, right? So um, if you do that only once a year, maybe you don't build the muscle uh, that well, right? If you do it once a quarter, you will be more used to the steps that it takes. Um, and of course, monthly is what, uh, what we are doing. Um, when it comes to driver-based forecasting, what needs to happen is that the business identifies uh, business drivers, things like streaming hours, active accounts, ad revenue, built versions for operating systems or players in our case, right? Um, the growth of these business drivers can then be forecasted and applied to cloud workloads. Uh, so for example, a database may grow with active accounts while a mobile front end may grow with st streaming hours. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, <clears throat> now you have got a little diagram, we'll put a diagram up on stream about the, the Roku as your driver-based forecasting system. It's actually AWS. <laughs> oh, sorry, my, my apologies. The uh, the Roku AWS driver-based forecasting system. Uh, we'll pop yeah. it up on screen. Can you just briefly talk to the sort of the main components of it uh, and how it, it sort of works and flows through? Yes, of course. So here we see the driver-based forecasting system we use. On the top left, uh, we use a simple database to capture business driver forecasts rate and usage optimization efforts, and new workloads or substantial changes to existing workloads. Uh, on the bottom left, we ingest the AWS cost and usage report via Athena into Apache Airflow, uh, which is a batch processing system. Tasks within Airflow, so-called directed acyc acyclic graphs or DAGs, directed acyclic graphs or DAGs, then process the billing data and apply the drivers to the individual workloads to build the forecasts. The forecasts are then stored in Amazon Redshift, where we use Google Looker as our data visualization tool. The same forecasts are also written to our data lake, where ad hoc queries can be run using Apache Superset. This entire system runs every day at 6.30 p.m., and it takes about an hour to finish. 
And in terms of uh, this sort of looking at those main components, you know, you, you got the visualization, obviously you got your ingestion, your sources. What were the sort of first components that you built? How was the, the evolution of that? Or was it like, we need to build this entire system. It doesn't work without everything. Was there an evolution to, to the components of that? Yeah, you can you can say there was a little bit of an evolution. We um, we already used um, Looker on Redshift. That was something that is um, you know used throughout the company, not for forecasting, for other things, right? Um, so that sort of existed already, and and this is also why we picked Looker in the first place because that's sort of like the BI tool that that we already licensed, right? The next thing that we um, that we built when we started really with trend-based forecasting, to be honest, right? We didn't just jump into the cold water with driver-based forecasting. We tried to do good with trend-based forecasting, right? Um, we needed to ingest the billing data um, into um, you know a system where we can then review it, collate it, and and those kind of things, right? So that we can get the monthly um, spent numbers for a specific business owner. Um, and when we built the trend-based forecasting, uh, it turns out that we had about a 10% variance and uh, Roku has about uh, 100 billion annual spent on AWS. Um, the 10% the was $10 million. That, that's, a big, and, that's a big, big, big dollar figure, exactly. Yes, yes. And, and finance uh, was not amused by, uh, <laughs> by a $10 million variance, right? So that is where we realized, hey, you know, we need to do better. Um, and we need to find uh, a different way of, of doing this. And, and this is where I came up with the driver-based forecasting. Nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, and that is it for the first part of this episode with data around forecasting. If you've got any questions you'd like to ask or any feedback, send an email to finopsfridays at aptio.com and we can definitely get those answered in the mailbag in the next episode. So stay tuned for next week's episode.